Thank you all for um, coming out this evening. Um, I'm very excited for our conversation, um, which I feel will really um, reflect a lot of the work that um, is in this exhibition around you. Um, to quickly introduce our panelists um, from your right, um, we have Paolo Chirio. Um, he works with systems of distribution, organization, and control of information that affect the flows of social, economic, and cognitive structures. Sherio has presented solo shows at Nome Contemporary Art Gallery in Berlin, Belgard Center Culture in Toulouse, Casa Gallery in Istanbul, Turkey, um, Asokima Institute for in Contemporary Art in Slovenia in 2011 and 2003. Um, beside him is Jenny O'Dell, who is a Bay, native, Bay Area native who mines imagery from online environments, most typically Google Maps, in an attempt to create candid portraits of humanity and its built environment. Because her practice exists at the intersection of research and aesthetics, Odell has been compared to a natural scientist. Her work has been exhibited at Google Maps headquarters, Les Rescondres de Arles, Art Santa Monica, Photo Museum Antwerpen, and the East Wing Gallery in Dubai, among others. Um, beside me is Jan Sudheim. He is a video and visual artist from Dortmund, Germany, where he still lives and works. Sudheim has studied information science and then photography at the St Studium de Informatique under Universidad Dortmund and at the University of Plymouth and earned his master's degree at Meisterkust Arno Fischer in Berlin. He also received an MA in photography at HAW Hamburg in 2013. His webcam project, um, which is on view here in the projection room, um, entitled The Traveler, is a collaboration with Bernhard Roos and was selected um, by Martin Parr to be part of the From Here On exhibition at the Recondarste Arles Photography Festival 2011. Um, Yukiko Yamata was scheduled to join us this evening. Um, unfortunately, she is under the weather. Um, so we will be participating in the conversation um, without her, sadly. Um, so I think I'll just go ahead and get started um, after we welcome our panelists. <laughs> um, so this exhibition kind of was formulated over the past 18 months. And at the time, I s proposed the exhibition in fall of 2013, so it was only a couple of months after um, the revelations of Edward Snowden um, that June. Um, and as I was working on the exhibition, um, we had you know, more changes and more changes both to diplomacy and mm, laws here in the US and internationally. Um, so that's been almost like one of the challenges that I've had in writing about the exhibition and even thinking about it um, is that our our cultural climate keeps changing and the laws keep changing around these, these ideas and issues. Um, for, for me in the US and for Jenny, who's also um, based in the US, um, these issues kind of came to the fore right after 9-11 um, when we had the Patriot Acts passed in October 2001. Um, and also within that same decade, we had corporations such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all coming onto the fore and becoming methods of social communication um, by which we could share images at the same time as governments and corporations were trying to gather information and images from us. Um, so I think it would be nice to hear each, um, for each one of you what were like the key elements in your practices or even in your lives um, that made this current, what, what I'm calling the society of surveillance, what made that um, all the more apparent to you and what was like the most powerful um, changes that you experienced? Anyone can start. Um, I try to start. Um, yeah, it's actually an amazing day to have an opening <laughs> for this exhibition because there are so many news regarding the regulation or legislation about mass surveillance and um, even a statement from uh, um, the CEO of Apple accusing Google and Facebook of like taking advantage of their users that is very surprising <laughs> in a way. Um, 
my personal experience that I started to use encryption or I started to learn encryption like probably 20 years ago and was something very like um, um, unusual or like only for the hacker communities. And so privacy, cons the concern for privacy was always there. And um, all of a sudden this thing called Facebook happened and uh, I started to see all these people publishing this personal information and like uh, freely and it was very um, strange for my background or like for my experience about internet and privacy. And so that's why I started to work on this project uh, on Facebook because it was such of a incredible thing to me to be able to get all this data so easily of a uh, hundred of thousands of people and uh, make something happen. And uh, from that point on to today, it seems that a lot of things have been changing. Also the way people like uh, share this information on Facebook. I don't see so many having their uh, face on their main profile picture, for instance, as four years ago or like even two years yeah, ago. Yeah, it's interesting. There was kind of like the zenith where everyone was posting everything about themselves and then they kind of like realized that, oh, maybe this isn't the best thing. <laughs> maybe they got some, some bad feedback. So now people, I think, are being a lot more selective about what they're posting, um, which is also very interesting. And there's been kind of a wave in the past two years of a lot of my colleagues and friends actually deleting their Facebook profiles. So I'm not saying that it's really on the way out, but it's going in another direction. People are censoring themselves more. Yeah, so I guess um, I've been making work with Google Maps since like 2009. Um, and one of the things I've noticed is obviously it's just like ever expanding. It's kind of like this digital manifest destiny thing where every last corner of the earth is supposedly supposed to be mapped. Um, and so I haven't really been thinking so much about um, surveillance from like a legal standpoint, but just more like the incidental, um, like these people in these prints over here that are just, they're on Google satellite as like surplus information. Like they were just kind of caught there. Like you happen to be in Dolores Park on this day that this imagery happened to be made. Um, it's extremely candid for that reason. Like it's, it's not um, targeting anyone necessarily like in that space. It's just like completely arbitrary. Um, but as this imagery is expanding, like more and more people get caught in this imagery. So now that there's like the, the look inside feature where you can go inside businesses, which um, for whatever reason, um, I, so I live in San Francisco. Um, the street that I live near is like all of those businesses are mapped. Um, also the street view car I used to park on my block, yeah. weirdly. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, like going in there and you know, like it's people's faces are not as um, consistently blurred as they are on street view, regular outside street view. Um, so I guess my interest has just been in seeing um, how like as this imagery is expanding its scope, how many more people are kind of incidentally caught in the net of this imagery. Right, and we were also, um, Jens and I were having a conversation yesterday about the Google Street View and how you can request to have your face blurred out. Um, so if it's a newer form of Google Street View, maybe people aren't really aware that it's happening and that they're even on there um, to request that. Um, it's also interesting to think about how Google kind of frames the, their actions in that way, that they're kind of, they encourage you to stand in front of the Google Street View camera and then, you know, share your photographs of it and try to make it into another form of selfie or another form of, look at me, I was in this place. Um, so I think they're, I mean, obviously they're trying to mitigate any potential legal implications of having someone, undes you know, caught in an undesirable act or on Google Street View that they didn't want. Um, so that it's interesting that with the way they're trying to create it almost as another form of social media. Actually, um, on that note, I taught a class in, on social media at the San Francisco Art Institute and my students are on Street View during break, <laughs> waving at the camera. <laughs> so. um, yeah, so um, my project, or Bernard and my project, The Traveler, um, started in 2001. So been doing it for quite a long time and um, at the time we started it, it wasn't even supposed to be about surveillance. It just um, interestingly became one and, and it's shown in that context uh, f because 
things have changed until then. At the time being, it was just an, an exploration of this phenomenon of people putting up webcams for whatever reasons and, and, and having uh, live imagery um, streamed on the internet or not streamed at the time, JPEG, small JPEGs, really compressed, low quality um, style and, and show whatever they were aware of um, or able to show, sometimes just some random street corner view out of their window with just some whatever thing. Uh, maybe very uninteresting and it was interesting for us that people do that and how that uh, is yeah how, how you can can put that in the context of, of contemporary photography mm -hmm. so um, yeah. yeah so when you were working the project since 2001 um, after like maybe was it after 9/11 or after Facebook was invented in 2000 2004, Facebook was invented. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, was there any like moment in during those 14 years of 2001 till now, where you felt like the project changed meaning, or you felt it was perhaps more difficult to position yourself in that way, to gain access to the cameras or to the places? I I, um, I was more relaxed about working on it, doing it, going to these places, and now sometimes I feel more like an intruder when I go to places I'm not supposed to be and I was at the time I started I was I thought yeah okay I'll just go there and, and see what happens and now I'm not that relaxed anymore so I'm, I'm it did affect me the time with um, um, yeah the, the, the fact that there is more um, are this revelations about um, security and surveillance uh, uh, it, it, it started, I don't know. It definitely puts it in a, in a different years ago. light. Yeah. It's interesting, by the way, that at the time um, um, it started, or we started our, our project, um, webcam users, they had kind of a communities, and so it was like an early social network. It was long before um, Facebook. People would just share their images there and say, well, right. look, I have a nice window view here. Have a look. Exactly. Well, kind of yeah, <laughs> I think the webcam thing was something that really happened in the early 2000s um, before there were these other um, forms and systems of information and image sharing. Um, and I think it's the decline of webcams is an interesting way to think about perhaps governments or corporations or city centers not wanting um, that kind of access, that kind of, d I mean, that they still exist, as you know. Mm -hmm but they're mostly operated by the police or operated by the organizations yeah. in charge. Yeah, or Google Map is everywhere, so you or don't Google need Google Map yeah. anymore. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to, I think the, the webcam came out of the invention of the CCTV, which we have in, of course, Julia Scherer's piece on the right, um, which she created in 1993. Um, so it was, you know, decade, at least a decade before you guys were working, these ideas are very much at the forefront. Um, her work in the 1980s, 1990s is all about um, surveillance, both on cameras, by corporations, by the government. Um, and she's not alone. You know, there's, I could go on and on, there's lots of artists that have been working for decades um, in this field. But if any of you had anything more to add about why this is so important in the past, like, 10 years, um, and what's really accelerated our concern and our sense of being over surveilled. Well, I think the idea, the notion of privacy uh, is changing all the time. I mean, it's like uh, uh, also the, the question of social norms start changing all the time. Like there is like some statement by Mark uh, Zuckerberg that says, you know, I want to change the social norms and he managed to do so. I mean, it was like, uh, you know, his own, uh, mission in a way and um, and so that means that um, it's gonna be also different in 10 years from now you know maybe people don't will see the selfie as a silly thing why now they're all obsessed about that and so on so that is for sure something and uh, and then there is also the idea of what is um, for this uh, surveillance in a way. So for example, if you're talking about the CCTV camera in UK issue, um, uh, it's been revealed that, you know, that there are 
totally pointless. They are not useful to like, you know, uh, tackle like crime in a way. And so it seems that it's like only for uh, controlling through fear, basically. And mass surveillance of today through internet somehow was also like something like that in a way. Yeah. Yeah, to pick up on to pick up on that, it's like what is the point of surveillance? We've kind of accepted it as something that we have either have to deal with or something that we can contribute to. Um, and of course, like there's always the debates of you know what did we ever gain from things like the Patriot Act? Did it ever like make us more safe? Um, but it's kind of this expectation that in order to like function as a society, we need some type of surveillance. Um, so, like, I guess that's the question, like, how, you know, can society function without either self-surveillance or a larger governing body that is watching? I mean, I feel like some of the drive for this kind of technology is this more abstract desire to be able to see everything all the time. Like, it just makes me think of, um, how I just read this book called The Edgelands, um, and it's about the UK, but it's this kind of like nowhere spaces, like the industrial parks and like marshlands and stuff, and that there are fewer and fewer dark spaces. So there's just like motion sensor lights on everything. Like we don't have dark urban or like ex-urban spaces anymore. Um, and for me, that's kind of like the physical analog to like we don't have dark spaces on the internet as much anymore. Um, and that's like equally terrifying but reassuring. Like we want to be able to see everything, but we also don't want to be part of the everything that's seen. Um, and so that's why personally I'm really drawn to like the blurriness of the, at least in this piece, like the blurriness of these figures. Like on the one hand you can see them, but on the other hand you can't really tell anything about them at all. It just is like almost, it brings you to a point where it's very enticing, but then you can't go beyond that. Like you can't know anything more about these people. And I mean, that's something I think about too with like the proliferation of images of people. Um, like I know I, uh, before I had Instagram, somebody, um, one of my friends saw an, a photo that had been taken of me by a stranger on the BART. <laughs> um, when I'm not looking at the camera and I had no idea that it was taken. Um, and the caption is just like stranger number one or something. I also look, I look really, um, like really sad, in, but I had just come from the gym. So I was like, I was really tired and it's this totally decontextualized photo and I have no idea that it's being taken. And I felt really violated by that. Um, and I think that's like probably a normal response, but at the same time, like no one really knows anything about me from that photo. So like, I think like, there's been this like amassing of information, but not only is it maybe useless, but it's also like doesn't really give you the access or the control that like one would equate with like having more like more information doesn't equal more like knowledge or access to a person. It's, it's right, very and it's like going that kind of like very well connects to Paolo's piece where he's pulling you know the profile pictures and names off of Facebook and putting them onto the, a fake dating website. And the you know the outrage that people had of being violated with their you know their names and their images violated, when they were willingly putting that information out there to one website but not to another, so it's like we're entrusting Facebook, but we're not willing to entrust someone else with the very same information, um, and then, you know of course then we could go there with the the government surveillance too. We're putting all this information out there very publicly. Um, but are outraged when we learn that the government is tracking it and is collecting the metadata. Um, so it's it's this great, very interesting societal paradox that's constantly mm. at play. But you were going to say? Yeah, it's just something I'd like to add. It's uh, what I noticed. I'm, I'm beside doing webcams. I also sometimes take a camera in my hand and, and, and do photography. And people react differently over the years, over the last years. They are more suspicious. They look at me strangely when I point a camera at people, and it wasn't like that some years ago. So at the same time that people expose themselves so much online, um, they get seem kind of scared when there's a, actually a camera pointing at them. So that's kind of strange. A friend of mine, he's, uh, he's working in an, uh, for an uh, insurance company, and he said he can um, find out way more stuff about people by just becoming friends with them uh, on Facebook uh, than by being investigating really what he used to do earlier, earlier. So that's kind of strange thing as well. Yeah, yeah very. Um, so going back to the question of like how much surveillance do we need in order to function as a society or in order to be good citizens, whatever that means. Um, 
I think the thing that's not being talked about a lot in these conversations that are happening over the you know the past few days and the past few years um, is not just is it you know is it right or wrong is it an invasion of our privacy um, for governments or corporations to be collecting data about us, um, but also like what does it mean for society at large? Um, I think there's we even touched on kind of an idea of the issue of privacy and what privacy means. Um, but if we're talking about not necessarily um, collecting information or surveilling an individual, but a, a, a citizenry, you know, basically the international population, um, how can that affect behavior and how can that affect our freedom to act or say? Yeah, well, but um, the question to blend uh, security and privacy is something that is a rhetoric that the you know intelligence community is pushing to keep in place this uh, mass surveillance program. But that has to do with a larger problem about you know uh, uh, punishment in this society or how you you know like uh, um, um, try to. Um, crack down crime that should be uh, way less violent or like more you know connected to the community so if we wouldn't even need surveillance if people would you know uh, watch over the community that they have next mm -hmm. to uh, where they live and I don't know how to explain but the, the entire idea of surveillance wasn't an issue before of um, you know um, kind of uh, capitalism or like neoliberalism for right. instance. Right, I mean like the very idea and of even surveillance the, yeah, and the came about time, in the yeah. mid yeah, 19th century. When we and at the same time even privacy itself wasn't an issue. If you think like the idea of privacy like started to be a thing like you know uh, with the private property so that people didn't want to share anymore in a way. So that are, that are things, things that are changing and have to do with uh, wider like uh, cultural frameworks. And uh, there's also a cultural issue, for instance, connected to this uh, uh, strict Google, uh, Google Street View. In Germany, they don't like to uh, share the picture of their mm -hmm. houses, for yeah, example. Can, you can get your houses blurred uh, if you don't want your, your house on, on Google Street View, you can just tell them and they get blurred and looks really spacey and uh, I don't know if they do it in other... No, I think it's the only country actually, it's <laughs> funny well, enough. There's those so. photographs by Mishka Henner um, of the, the Dutch government mm -hmm. blurring out all the government, um, basically the government sites and their versions of what would be the Pentagon um, and military sites. So you'll have the very high resolution image of the Dutch landscape and then you'll see the blurred out version, the blurred out buildings, because um, they don't want to call attention to it, but in doing that, they're, they're obviously <laughs> contradicting themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but Jenny or Jens, what are your thoughts on how our expectation of surveillance um, is kind of, you know, can control our behaviors as a society? What comes into my mind is um, photographer Lorca de Quartia, who did this Heads series. I don't know people who know it. He shoot in New York on, on Times Square, I think, and, and he got sued for it because people uh, saw their faces on a photography book, and, and then he said, well, there's no expectation of privacy anymore in a public place. And that kind of sums it up, I think. Um, it's not like it should be, but it's like it is, I guess. Right, right. Not even that we're expecting privacy, but um, that we feel that we can't, you know, congregate or gather or maybe speak about something publicly um, because, w you know, we're fearing that the police might be watching or a corporation might be watching who might have something to say about that, might put us in danger. Um, it makes me think of two, two weird stories that um, two students of mine separately told me. One is... Um, I had a student from India who mentioned there's a town um, in India that's referred to in articles about it as like a smart town. So it's like a little village, but it's supposed to be like very technologically savvy. Um, and part of what makes it a smart town is that it has CCTVs like on every block or something like that, like a really high ratio of cameras. But then the people watching the cameras is this committee of 11 people. Um, and supposedly there's just like, they, they cite like there's not as much crime and like people aren't dropping out of school because the school is being watched 
on these cameras. So it's like, I don't know, like it, it's, I've, I, the article that I read was painting it in a positive light as part of this like, yeah, the smart, smart town. Um, and then it also makes me think of uh, another student who went to Dubai said that um, a friend of his there, um, I guess, was in a mall that was very crowded. And his, I, I think the friend was very wealthy. Um, and his son was, um, someone attempted to kidnap his son. Um, and so the son disappears and then he like called, I guess the equivalent of 911 and they were like, oh yeah, we see your son. Okay, there's a, there should be a car coming now. Okay, we got him, here's your son. And it was like really efficient and like obviously a relief, but he was really unsettled by like how, like, how quickly that all happened. Um, and of course like Dubai is also the area where they're combining like the Google Glass with the cops, the cops with Google Glass, it's facial recognition. So, um, so yeah, I just think that those are two interesting cases of like, on the one hand, I, I guess residents could feel relieved, but on the other hand, also like very unsettled because they are also implicated in that network. Right, right, and that we, again, we have that dichotomy of having these systems that make life easier for us, such as Google Maps, and then also having the very same systems that almost are threatening to us or potentially threatening to us, depending on whose hands that information is in. Um, so I think it would be interesting if you both could speak a little bit, of, all three of you could speak a little bit about um, that dichotomy between public and between government and corporation, because um, that's something that's really come to the fore in the past couple of days um, with the Patriot Act um, Section 215 expiring here in the US um, and us talking about how the metadata from our cell phones and from our email conversations, the government cannot legally use that without a search warrant, without going through the courts, um, but the corporations can still hold on to it the way that they've always been doing. And for some people that seems like a relief and that seems like the way it should be. Um, but I think it's called into question like why that seems so much of a better option for us and why that seems like less constraining on our freedom or on our privacy. Well, there is also a distinction uh, for um, the companies that are uh, abusing our privacy f as a business model, basically. So that is not really about surveillance. It's actually, you know, uh, gathering all this data and doing data mining and extract value. Right. Out I mean, of it's it. surveillance, but to a different end. Yeah, they just with want to sell very us different more things. End. Yeah, and yeah. then you have the government or like other kind of uh, agency, like taking advantage of these companies and the information that they acquire to do surveillance and eventually uh, using that information as like um, intelligence uh, information that has nothing to do with crime in a way, but has more to do with controlling a country, an entire country, economically, politically, and, um, and so on. So it's like, you know, there are like different use that you can have over the, you know, information of people and also specifically like on personal information, sensible information of people. So if I would like make some distinctions in that, yeah. No, yeah, there's definitely distinctions, but also there's, at least in this country, it's kind of a, a well-known fact that corporations and governments are freely sharing information between them. Um, so it just the fact that this information is being stored somewhere and is being collected um, just puts all that information at risk for eventual leakage or yeah, and that has to do also not only to you know tackle crime like uh, street crime or any kind of crime like the kidnapping of a baby, but it's actually I mean or at least in my opinion it's like to control uh, you know um, to understand how. Um, you know, people is uh, acting in masses in a way. So it's not actually, it's like intelligence in a way. It's just like getting information to understand uh, uh, how people is acting and eventually control economy, like taking advantage of some particular information. Jenny or Jens? Um, I mean, in, uh, in Germany, it's kind of similar. They used to, they wanted to, to pass a law allowing um, the government to, to collect your phone and internet uh, data uh, some time ago, maybe two years ago, and then the uh, higher institution said, no, you can't do that, it's against uh, personal 
uh, rights or personal freedom. And just recently they're doing it again and they made some minor changes and then um, this time I think it's going to pass. So it's, um, yeah. it's just I, something I, I notice and then they, at the end they, they do it anyway. Kind right, of. exactly, that was kind of my point in the end everyone's going to get the information anyway. And they, it says that you, um, the data is um, just stored for 10 weeks or so, but you know, how can you control right. that they and the fact that erase they were that, I mean, and, and journalists and other kind of uh, groups, or certain groups of people are um, off that list, so they're not allowed to take um, the data of, of journalists, but you know, it's kind of hard for to most say people, who is yeah. and who isn't. And, and Right, and I mean, for the fact that 11, for 11 years or so, the government was collecting metadata without telling us and without us knowing what's going to indicate that they're suddenly going to stop just because it's in the Senate and it's in the news. Yeah. Well, so I think, like, even if, even if they're eventually going to get the information anyway, I think, like, recent events are just important for, like, symbolic reasons, like, just that we can all, like, agree that, like, um, overall, this has like sort of gone too far, and it just, um, I mean, that's how I feel about a lot of work that's done about like privacy and surveillance, like um, it's symbolic, like um, it's not actually, like the, like the off pocket that you can put your phone in, like I don't know anyone who actually uses that, but just it's like as an art piece, it's just like making a statement that this is like something that someone thought of that resonates with people. Um, but I do wonder like if, this shift includes like, I just wonder what comes after this, like in terms of like attitudes towards surveillance, like, or rea maybe like reactions, um, like responses to like what is, I mean, you can't hide inside your house. So like, what are like, you know, like the other responses? Exactly, like um, what we're left like figuring out, like we have this culture, which is, you know, part of our society now that we do have these social media networks and they do have value. I mean, we do want, we still continue to use them, or most of us do. Um, so, and on the other hand, we still want to maintain, if not some level of privacy, even if we say, oh, I don't care, and everyone can see everything, we still want to maintain some level of um, control over governments or corporations that are trying to access this information. So, in the end, of, you know, we're saying kind of what can we do, um, and what's the, what's the way out, so to speak. Yeah, sometimes um, I say that um, internet is a kind of a new public space, and so we are just learning how to use and, uh, you know, acting in this public space. Right. So as, you know, we had like um, um, big cities and we were still uh, walking inside naked and we were rude to everyone and we, you know, had that uh, way, unpolite way to act in that public space, uh, like unsecure in a way, too. Now, with internet, it's the same. So we are, we are learning that we should use encryption. We are learning that we shouldn't share everything uh, about our life, and so meaning not be completely naked on internet mm -hmm. and, um, you know, not be rude, not taking picture of some people that uh, are not uh, giving us the consent to, um, being photographed, for instance, that is still an issue because people are like taking pictures everywhere <laughs> right now. So, not right now, but out there. So in a way, I think, you know, it's like uh, we are very primitive still in this uh, internet environment and we will learn. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be good if all people would be aware of that um, and they what you shouldn't do and should do and, and yeah. this privacy thing on Facebook, for example, they, but exactly. they are not yet. No, or they have the to point learn is it. that Facebook is pushing on the other direction. Facebook is saying, no, we should share everything, just be friends. Mm -hmm. They <laughs> keep <laughs> asking me all the time where I went to school and blah, blah, blah. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, let's see, we'll win. I, I would also add, I think, like Mark Zuckerberg's statement that uh, having, what did he say, like if you, Either like not having a real profile or having more than one profile implies a lack of integrity. Yeah. Like I think that's a very telling statement um, <laughs> because it's kind of like it's like taking it as like self-evident that you should just like you are you like like one to one ratio like online. Um, it totally precludes like any kind of like like having a persona or like having like an online counterpart to you that's not you. I just think it's a really funny statement because like that your profile will never be you, it will never approach you, like as a human. Um, and so I just think maybe, I'm wondering if like at some point, like 
people will start will start to like recognize and like exploit that gap. Like this is me online and like this is me not online. I don't know. I would hope so. Right. And I think like each of you within your practices have tried to exploit or work between the systems that are already in place. Um, and you know, your work speaks to that. Um, so I guess in closing, if you wanted to each say something about that, or we could go straight to questions and answers. I mean, I'll just say, I mean, I already talked about the blurriness. Obviously, I'm obsessed with <laughs> blurry images. Um, but I think like, like the like the dream of like surveillance technology or, or even just like Facebook um, is like this total, like total transparency, like total access to like all information. And that is just very much not the case right now. There's like, you know, a lot that's human that's kind of like left out or not not um, able to be captured right now. And maybe someday it will be, but I find it productive at this particular moment to find and exploit those limits to show that they're there. Um, and then to also like reinstate what's the difference between the, the quantified kind of like surveilled self and then the actual human self. And I guess I just keep staring back at the cameras <laughs> as a way to treat it, to treat with it, to deal with it. So um, it, it's interesting, um, the traveler, the, the work, how people react to it. Some think it's really, it's a funny thing. Uh, and some think it's really, see it and think it's really, really scary. So it's, and it's between these two where everyone finds its position. So it's, uh, it's just something interesting I noticed. Um, I just um, I just had this new project that was about uh, <coughs> trying to find uh, pictures, selfies of um, intelligence official. That was also very interesting to see how um, actually NSA uh, directors uh, are you know on Facebook somehow or on Twitter, and um, um, and you can expose them in a way, or you can like do this counterintelligence on your own somehow. Uh, on the other end, uh, it was also interesting that uh, in UK, for example, it's, there is completely another policy, so it was impossible to find uh, um, intelligence official on uh, Facebook and Twitter because they always delete any kind of picture information that end up on the internet. And so that was my kind of last project on this, uh, on this field. Uh, it was also interesting in a way. Yeah, doing a little detective work <laughs> with what people are putting out there. Um, I guess with that, we can take some questions from our audience. Um, if you raise your hand, um, Larissa will bring you a microphone because we're recording. Great. Thank you. Very interesting talk. I, um, I think somebody did get into the fact that there is a, a market essentially around surveillance. Uh, the, I was recently in Venice and instead of selling fake Rolexes, the people on the street selling stuff to tourists were, they were actually selling selfie sticks which is a, a very telling thing. It's the first thing I've seen, and I do a lot of traveling. It's the first time I've seen this. So, I mean, if just the micro version of it, but as some, someone did mention that, um, you know, it's the idea of gathering data to see what we want to buy to contribute to the consumer economy. So as long as capitalism continues to profit from surveillance, it's not going anywhere, uh, unless capitalism does, and uh, that's re reasonably well entrenched. Um, the other thing I would offer as a comment for contemplation is that, um, there is the aspect of sort of innate criminality. Uh, keep in mind that prisoners are surveilled in a way that they don't necessarily know that they may be being watched. In a watchtower uh, instance, uh, the panopticon, as Michel Foucault describes it, um, in a sense, that's what the larger society has become. Our, our so-called non-criminal selves are surveilled, whether we realize it or not. So if we do truly value what we believe to be a right in the Bill of Rights, the right to privacy, we have to realize that surveillance has compromised democracy to the extent that one way or another, under the surveillance society, we are essentially criminals or potentially criminals. Uh, to consider that possibility is to consider the future of surveillance and whether or not our society should evolve beyond it. Yeah, on the other end, <coughs> And that was also the last project that I did about the fact that um, we should and we are now able to violate some privacy of some politicians and some bankers and some, you know, some uh, people is doing wrongdoing. So it's actually a good thing, this 
uh, fact that the internet allow us to access to information that wasn't accessible before. And uh, so that is really, uh, again, a distinction between, uh, you know, um, who deserve to be protected and who doesn't, or like what we can do with this new environment and these new tools in a way. But you are also right that, of course, I mean, uh, um, we are living in a capitalist society, so the companies will push and extract value from our personal data. And that is why, you know, encryption is a big question now, uh, because if Google and Facebook do, will implement uh, this kind of encryption technology, they will lose. Uh, access to our personal data and they will lose revenue on that. I mean, they will still make money on the traffic on it, let's say, but not on our personal data. And so that would shift, again, totally the business model that they had since now, in a way. So, who knows? Oh, I just wanted to add, um, on the subject of the Panopticon, um, one of the points of that design was that you wouldn't need to use corporal punishment, so it's kind of like punishment, or not, there is no punishment, uh, like control is built into the system, it's just like all pervasive. And sometimes I ask um, my students like how they feel about being recorded everywhere, and sometimes their response is, um, "I don't care because I just won't do anything wrong." Um, and like that's the point at which like that like it's been completely internalized. Like it does not need to be exercised after the fact. That also means that everyone, yeah, is a potential criminal. Great. Okay, we're just gonna do this one over here, and then we'll come back to you. Um, I just want to echo what you were saying, and. You know, when you think about um, the, the cameras being set up outside of schools and people are, the kids are not cutting school. And you think about, you know, maybe that kid that would have cut school would go to a field and stare at the clouds all day and then eventually come up with some amazing, like, discovery and, um, you know, do something that changes the world in a beautifully positive way. And now these kids or people in general are more conscious of not doing something wrong. I mean, we're expecting this kind of bad behavior with all of this surveillance. We're looking for bad behavior. We're not looking for something actually positive to happen from it, which I think really impacts society in a negative way. Right, it's a very passive yeah. like, system of control if you know that there's gonna be cameras, if you know that there's gonna be surveillance, you might not like participate in a march or in a, in a protest. Um, you, staring at the right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yes, but I'm just gonna encourage everyone to move forward for this last section of the panel. And this gentleman's been waiting, but we'll get to you next for sure. Um, well, I was just thinking about uh, what my friend was talking about I, and, and various aspects of that, uh, those ideas. Like if you take into account, like, um, like a dream of the capitalist idea is, or one of the dreams, is the perfect flow of goods, services, and information. And of course, prob part of the problem would be is that if it was a perfect flow, uh, sort of the, the transparent flow, then that information couldn't be commoditized. It, you couldn't protect your, uh, either your copyrights or your uh, your engineering systems or or, or for that matter um, software issues and of course then you have the m much older ideas um, sort of from George Orwell where the totalitarian state observing us all the time and then you have Huxley who basically kind of says well we'll simply give those controls over to the state it's which one is in they're both in competition with each other, and who will win is, well, hopefully neither. <laughs> but uh, um, it's, uh, I think you have brought up all of those points. Thank you. Um, did you have a question? Can you, can you come over here? Because this microphone is only so long. Um, I just wanted to get back to uh, the being young and um, growing up under surveillance and what that really actually means, which is, at least to me anyway, um, the idea of growing up with no privacy ever. So, and I had this thought the other day and I thought to myself, what would my life be like if my entire adolescence was on camera? <laughs> and it uh, was rather a scary thought, uh, to say the least. Um, 
and I, I think that'd probably be true for about everybody in the room. Um, but I was really thinking about um, the younger kids who weren't around 14 years ago before 9-11 um, who are growing up with no concept of the idea of what privacy really means. So I didn't really have a question, but I'd love to hear what you think of that. And Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, my friend's friend has a son who's 14, 13, 14, mm -hmm. and he has some app that like tells him where the kid is all the time. I think this is very common, apparently. Uh, I didn't know that. You apparently track your child. Yeah, you track yeah. your child. Just like find my phone, <laughs> find my child. Yes. It's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't think, I don't know if they know, I don't know how many of these kids know that they're being tracked. I, I don't know. I, anyway, I, like, I'm not an expert on this. But um, yeah, and then also it, it makes me think of, um, like, I just feel, um, I don't like, have any like, specific example of this, but I've heard from like, people who are older than me and like by comparison, people are younger, that um, it, it used to be a much more common practice to just let your kid just go wherever. Like, you're like, be back by six. And now mm -hmm. it's like, not only are you tracking your kid, but it's like, I need to be able to see you all the time. And it's done from this point of view of like, you know, like you love your child, but it's also just like totally, I just feel like a lot of this is driven by like stranger danger, not just for your kids, but we, like everyone seems much more mistrustful of, of each other. Um, and then also this, yeah, like I said, this desire for transparency and control and quantification and knowing where everything is at every mm. possible time. It's almost like putting like RFID tags on like everything in your life. Um, so. I guess every parent would say it's a good thing. It's, it's good that I know where my kid is and, and that I can reach him all the time. But there were times uh, when I grew up, it wasn't, I, I didn't have a, a, a phone in my pocket and but and I survived anyway, so yeah. it's, it's uh, <laughs> Are there any other questions? Oh, lots more. Uh, let's, let's get you and then we'll get you. Um, one thing I liked what you said was about um, these sort of like unquantifiable, non-surveillable spaces. And um, I was kind of wondering how you'd maybe define those spaces. I, 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 I'm very interested in this idea too, because especially when you think of maybe Facebook or any sort of social media um, space as, um, as, as some sort of quantified um, surveilled space where you're kind of like people are, are, or are kind of like inclined to perform themselves um, um, f uh, for, uh, for an audience of friends. And they, um, so what happens to this, like, like what happens, to, uh, like, who is that person that's not being, like, what happens, like, is there some sort of, like, fissure and identity um, in terms of how they're performing online or in social spaces versus what they're not including in that performance of, uh, in, in relation to surveillance? Like, how does maybe surveillance cause us to perform and what is kind of being excluded from that performance in relation to surveillance? Yeah, I mean, I, it makes me think of the, um the Hassan Alahi piece, which I'm sure you know about. Yeah, um, does, are you people familiar with this piece by, okay, so Hassan Alahi is someone who was detained um, trying to come back into the US, um, even though he was a US citizen. And I'm, I'm, ter I'm shortening the story a lot, you should just look it up. Um, but basically, um, yeah, he was taken by INS, and then they basically said um, that you, they, they never quite cleared him, and they just said, um, every time you travel now, you should just check in with us. That was like their wording. Um, and so he's like, oh, you want me to check in with you? I'll send you photos of like every single meal that I eat, every bathroom that I use, every airport that I fly through. He has a website that shows like GPS, like where he is all the time. And it's obviously like tongue in cheek um, and so, and self-aware. Um, and so I think that's like an extreme example of somebody like, like it's so ironic because it's like performing transparency, but it's obviously not transparent. Um, so I just think it has to do with um, self-awareness. I think there are people who use Facebook that never think about this and are absolutely offering everything 100% as to the best of their knowledge about themselves. And then that's what I was saying earlier, I would hope that the shift would be towards people like thinking about like, oh, I don't have to do that. Like n there's nothing saying that I have to do that. And I just, I remember noticing, I had my students make fake Facebook profiles, A, to see how much harder they've made that to do. I mean, you can still do it. Um, and then everyone just chose like really absurdist things. Like one of my students was kale salad. Um, <laughs> and like, just like the giddiness that I saw in them and realizing that they did not have to adhere to the kind of like 
what high school did you go to? What are your favorite? Like, oh, it's like I'm putting in my favorite movies, but these aren't my favorite movies. And there was just like such like joy and playfulness in that. Um, not it wasn't just like subversive. It was actually like fun for them to do that. So um, that's something that I, I think, yeah, performance obviously has a lot to do with with that. Um, for me, it was amazing to have this uh, project with all these people like ending up in my own performance in a way and having them writing to me and have to write them and see how they were reacting to this provocation. And um, it was just like such an amazing thing that um, I don't think it was possible before in this uh, quantity, but also in this kind of uh, environment. So it still has to do with quantity, but it comes down to a personal issue really when uh, you find yourself in a dating website without your permission, of course. So, and everyone would react differently, of course. Okay, so we'll do this last question, and we'll we'll mingle and we'll reopen the bar, which is exciting. And and everyone will be here. So, if you have further questions, please to volunteer your time. Please talk to them during the opening. But here you go. Thank you. Uh, so, hi. I just have like basically two questions. Uh, one is uh, how are we going to basically talk about surveillance in a very global context? And two, like, w what about the basically the corporate's abuse of collecting data? Uh, the, my question is from a very pr uh, pragmatic standpoint. Uh, so like yesterday, uh, I, I guess we all know that USA Freedom Act is passed. Uh, this is deemed as like the biggest surveillance reform of U.S. since like 1978. Uh, and uh, at the same day, like last night, uh, Glenn Greenwald uh, tweeted this message. Uh, what, should, what is the message of USA Freedom Act? Uh, should, should, should we say like, dear world, only the rights to privacy of Americans matters? Um, and the second thing is, I don't know if you knew, uh, know about the Facebook uh, zero rating services or like zero rating services in general. Like Facebook is really big on that because face Facebook launched internet.org uh, in 2012. That is basically like in its nature, like capitalizing user data in developing countries and enlarge the Facebook networks having those user data from developing countries hold them as capitals, therefore provide zero rating, which is like free services, so-called free services. But in, in like users actually pay for their data. But in these developing countries, like uh, rights to privacy is actually a luxury. Like it's a, such a luxury rights. Like in countries that censorship is still like the main sure. problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, the, the question is like cross country, those big companies, like when we talk about surveillance, we only talk about like we sometimes address that onto govern, government surveillance, but how to withhold the rights of big corporations, like how to prevent them from collecting data for in their favor. Right, so I'm sure you know that Facebook is, they release drones over regions of Africa in order to provide um, Wi-Fi and internet access, um, with of course the end goal being that everyone would log on and create Facebook profiles. Um, so I forget a little bit what your first question was, but I um, <laughs> obviously, it will, and we touched on this, it's obviously a concern um, for both corporate and government standpoints, and they have different end goals. Um, and as to like the question of what we can do, it does have to take on not so much of a legal, it's not a legal answer, it's nothing that we can do within our own government. It's based in society, and it's based in the way that we function um, in, within our communications with each other, and we shouldn't stop tweeting, and we shouldn't stop um, using Facebook and social media communications, but there has to be a way of finding a societal balance um, that allows us to communicate freely, but also allows us to communicate freely in public space, um, physically and verbally, um, without the fear of being censored or controlled. 